There is no one perfect model, but Calvary Chapel has done this. Paul also says, as we look at verse 1, that anybody who desires this office, this office of elder, he desires a good, good thing. Let me just say this off the bat. What this doesn't mean that if you are male, you are qualified. Just because you are man doesn't mean you are qualified for the office of overseer. You can desire it. You can pray about it. In fact, we even said last week that that desire for office, the office of overseer, is a good thing. Is an honorable thing. In fact, sometimes in our life, God often uses our desires in our heart to accomplish His his will and purposes for our life. We looked at Psalm 37.4 and Philippians 2.13. If we believe that God is working in us both to will and to do His good pleasure, as we're delighting ourselves in Him, Psalm 37, then the desires in our heart must be from God. Of course, sometimes... Our hearts can be deceptive, and we understand that. Praise God for godly fellowship and counsel in His Word that can direct those those things. As we get into this, um, we're really asking the question, how is it that in this list, this, this list of 17 qualifications, how do we see the gospel in this list? And by the way, the gospel not just in the sense of Jesus loves me, this I know, because the Bible tells me so. But something way more grand, if you will, than that, although that's pretty grand. Let's pick up again verse 2. Verse 2 says, well, let's start in in verse 1 still. This saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. Therefore. Whenever you see that word in Scripture, it's a, it's a tying word. It's connecting a statement. It's a condition. Because of what was just written, therefore this. We need to remember something as we're going through this, that there is a, conting- a consistency and a legitimacy that matters. Okay? The consistency is, when we look at a man for the office of overseer, does he have a life that is consistent with what is spoken in this section of Scripture? Is he consistently being a man who is above reproach? Furthermore, when we're like, I don't know if Kyle up there is really qualified because of that one thing that happened. Well, I wonder then, is it legitimate? Meaning, if you have an accusation against a man who is in the office of elder, is he living a consistent life based on these qualifications? And is your accusation legitimate based on these qualifications? But something that you as a congregation need to understand as we look at this section specifically and exclusively for the elder is this. You are not being vetted by this list. Christian. I hope you're not thinking right now, oh, here we go again. Yet another list in Christianity of what to do and of what not to do. Yet again, here's a guy who's almost screaming, telling me I can't drink a beer. I can't chew tobacco. I can't dance. And I can't associate with those who do. That is by no means the takeaway of this list. In fact, this morning, the only qualification you need to be concerned about, the only little list, if you will, in your head that you should be really thinking and mowing over, The only, like, if I open my Bible and I find a qualification in my Bible, the only qualification you should be concerned about is that am I found in the qualifying, cleansing blood of Jesus? That's it. Am I qualified to be Christian simply because of Christ's righteousness? 
not any attempt on your effort to be found righteous. I go to church. I actually don't drink. I don't sleep around. I'm good. I keep a little moralist in my head. I'm cool. I'm not in jail. So who cares? The only qualifier you need to be concerned about is are you found in Christ perfect? If you're not found in Jesus being perfect, then you have a lot of things to work out with Him. Because the only way you're going to get into the presence of a holy God, whether you die today or whether you die 50 years from now, is that you are qualified by Jesus by His blood. Therefore, not to be qualified by Jesus' blood just throws away any list that you could ever think of. Throws away any qualification, any to do, anything. The only thing that matters is that you are literally found innocent by Jesus. The terrible thing that we often do in our moralistic attempts to please or appease God is putting things on people so that they are found somehow morally this side of heaven cool. When that's not at all the gospel. The gospel is this, that you have been found in Christ's righteousness alone. Not to be. You're swimming in your own pool of condemnation as you try to figure out your own salvation by your own effort. So this is a list, not for you if you don't know Jesus. And in fact, this isn't a list for you if you know Jesus. This is a list for the guy who's seeking to be an overseer in a church. So that guy better kind of get ready because this is all about him. And I hate to say that because I'm the guy and there's other guys like that. There's elders in this church, but this is kind of what it is. Certainly though, there are things that we can glean as women and men from this list. No doubt. However, I disagree with one particular author who uses this list uh, to codify men. Uh, let's take this really awesome list and let's make men better. Let's chalk up these 17 qualifiers and let's host a men's thing. And here, guys, here we go. You can be above reproach too. While I certainly don't disagree with that, this list is exclusively for the office of elder, not for every single man though men can glean from this list. Furthermore, remember, most of this list, and we're about to get into it, are completely character-based. In fact, there are only three in this list that are functional. Meaning, as you're observing an overseer or an elder, you're asking yourself, does this man have the character that this part of Scripture describes? Not, is this man acting in ways that I would assume he should be because he simply is a pastor, elder, or overseer? Why is that important? Because there's nowhere in this list that says you have to have been graduated from Liberty University School of Divinity or the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary or Gordon-Conwell or Harvard or your dad had to be a pastor before. Or you had to be connected to like Chuck Smith somehow and have your name next to his name where he's buried. Uh, not true. That's not found in here in the scripture whatsoever. Um, this is all driven by character. And by the way, it should be known uh, that there are plenty of individuals, plenty of men, who have been an elder in a church who have great degrees on their wall, their dad was a pastor, and they knew all of the great people in the world, but completely compromised the office of overseer. Of course, the opposite could be true with those who haven't been seminary trained, just kind of walked in, and they kind of glow with a whole bunch of cool stuff. They're charismatic. They have a great personality. They also, I'm sure, there are some who have compromised the office of overseer. What is the point here? The point is, it's character driven. That's it. It's who the man is inside. 
not what he's done necessarily on the outside. And by the way, this list should always be before the elders in the church. You should be thinking, is my pastor qualified? Are the elders here at Calvary Chapel Fayetteville qualified? Um, if we ordain in this church an assistant pastor or another elder, I'm not simply looking at him. I'm not interviewing him. I'm not giving him Calvary distinctives, which I will. I'm not giving him Chuck's ministry of philosophy, which I will. I'm going to be asking, hey, can myself and the elders also speak to your wife and children? Because I guarantee you, your wife and your children would absolutely be able to attest to the legitimacy of your character. You better believe that Megan Seeger knows what goes on behind my house when nobody from church is around. When Margie has eventually left. And it's just myself and my wife and my three children. She should absolutely be able to attest to my character as an elder and pastor. So let's get into it. The first one he says is that he is to be above reproach. Literally, not having been slandered against because of his actions. So this man needs to be so above any possible slander or any possible accusation to anything that would corrupt the office or the church by and large. However, what about false accusations? Those will not hold. Paul the Apostle, Billy Graham, Jerry Falwell, C.H. Spurgeon, Brian Broderson, Chuck Smith, all have been accused of things by either YouTube University or Google. And we look at those and we think those are viable. And we think, oh my goodness, what is that guy doing again? Look, with the, look at the little interview going on on YouTube now. Man, he's, he's unqualified. We need to, all of us have an alma mater in truth. The Bible. Furthermore, the Bible teaches that an accusation cannot be laid against an elder unless there are two or three other elders present to lay that accusation. And I know we are in a super hyper social media tweeting age. But we as Christians really need to guard ourselves against false slander and false accusation and gossip. As soon as you start hearing, have you heard? Especially when you're talking about an elder of a church. If I were you, I would just say, oh, I have it and I'm okay with that. And if I have an issue with that man in that pulpit at that church, I with my husband or I myself or I with my wife or whatever will have a conversation with him, the elder or elders. So be very careful about false accusations. How terrible it is for anyone who has been falsely accused. There's actually right now an internet like website business that literally is existing to help people who have been falsely accused of things to, to like get that undone on social media. Because there's just so much slander out there. But when you have a legitimate accusation, when a pastor is literally not above accusation, obviously a conversation needs to happen. And then he says, this man is to be the husband of one wife. This is a little spicy. I'm just going to tell you that right now. Okay? There are five views as to what this means. Let's look at them briefly. Number one. The husband of one wife or a one-woman man means that he's married to the church. The church is his bride. This is a Roman Catholic view of this verse, by the way. Um, that's weird because uh, we know that Peter was married. And, and, and the Roman Catholics have such a high view of Peter. And so it can't be that this is a warrant for celibacy. Number two, this is a prohibition of polygamy. Well, that's true, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 2. That's true for all people, though. All Christians. We're not supposed to have multiple wives. That's just not how it rolls in the church. 
you're a Christian, you get one wife. That's just what, you know, praise God for that. We're all one woman men, right? Number three, the prohibition of remarried widows, meaning if you widowed because you were, so your wife dies, uh, you're unqualified to be an elder. Well, that's not true. In 1 Timothy 5.14 and Romans 7, uh, verses 1 through 3, Paul has some pretty strong words about those who were widows in the church, which there's nothing about prohibiting them from eldership. Number four, the prohibition of singleness. Well, that's certainly not true and probably has the most uh, biblical non-weight in this argument. Jesus, Paul, even Timothy, we don't know if he was married. So there's no argument for a man who's single that can't be an elder. And here's the fifth one, and the one that I believe, well, the one that is what we believe, and the one that historically, conservatively, has held up uh, through the church. But we, we need to dig into this a little bit. The prohibition simply of divorce. Literally, no record of divorce. That is to say, that elder has never had another wife except the current wife he now has. If that man has been previously married, even before knowing Jesus, the scripture would teach not only for elder, not only for deacon, not only in Timothy, but also Titus, he is disqualified from eldership. And I don't know about you, but I feel that in my soul. Why? Because there are a lot of great men who are incredible Christ followers who you would want to appoint to eldership simply because of how they serve, how they love, who they are to their now married wife and their children. But the Bible teaches such a man is unqualified. But let me just say this. Just because you are that does not necessarily mean you have to be this. Furthermore, let that test a man's heart. Are you serving? Are you being in such a way because you really have a ooh for the pulpit or for leadership in the church as an elder? It shouldn't be so. The question may be, well, then why is that a big deal? A man like, he was not even saved. What's the big deal? You know, come on. He's cool, man. Like, look at him serve and... Do all that stuff. The problem is, at any given moment, that past marriage could hinder the work of Christ in that current church. What's keeping that past marriage, as if it were to be a ghost, coming back to haunt the validity of gospel ministry in that local church? She could rile just a whole bunch of accusations and who he was and you don't know, which would completely hinder gospel work from going out. Even if he wasn't even saved before. I uh, love and appreciate a lot of men who have a heart to serve God. Who want to be in some way, shape, or form leading in the church. And I want them to do that. But we as elders have a standard. Not simply because we are the most holy or the most religious. Because we are the guardians of the church itself. Specifically from heresy and slander and other things. Now, by the way, that is a very conservative view on that verse. There are Calvary chapels that would disagree with me. There are Calvary chapels that would agree with me. There are other denominations that would say, yes and amen. And then there are other denominations that say, I don't know about that. We love the Bible too, man. Hey, like, whatever. Um, some are about to think that my view on not being a drunkard is too liberal. I would hope that all of us, with our Bibles open, are seeing if these things are true. 
Unfortunately, those who have been in eldership, in leadership, because of the disregard of this list, because of the disregard of the pastoral epistles, have literally made a mess of the church and have robbed glory from Jesus and haven't even put it on themselves, but have put it on some ridiculous drama because of somebody not vetting them based on the qualifications of eldership. Next he says, sober-minded. That is to mean literally able to reason. He's a level head. Next is that he's self-controlled. Literally a pattern of personal discipline. What causes him to spend and what causes him to lose it? What makes him go buck wild? And what makes him conservative and reserved? Let me just say this. Behavior patterns are extremely important. I heard it said just a few weeks ago by a pastor, specifically for those who are looking to date somebody or court somebody or thinking about marriage, it really needs to matter to you, engaged woman or engaged man, what her or his patterns are. What their behavior is like. Way more than just on a date. Way more when they're with dad when he's cleaning the shotgun. Because those patterns, that behavior, I'm, I guarantee it is going to come out at three years in. Four years in. Twelve years in. A few affairs later. Behavior patterns for the eldership also matters a whole lot. Listen, one traffic frustration <laughs> compared to a life of being explosive are two different things. Like if you see me on, my, on the way to Fayetteville to pick up my, my daughter, and praise God, the 401 is now all cleaned up. I don't know if you were driving down the 401 with that like right lane all, like whatever. It was like New York City. I got a little frustrated. Okay. Uh, I have a manual, a manual transmission car right now, and you know it's. I, I haven't driven a manual in some time, and so I'm having to do these extra little thinking processes. Okay, I'm in fifth gear. Do I need a downshift? Can I just pop it in neutral, press this, the clutch thing, and brake? Okay, here we go. When a car stops right in front of you, for a person who hasn't been driving a manual for a long time, you can get frustrated, especially when you try and drink a hot cup of coffee. Uh, I, I hope if somebody saw me. And this Honda, you know, trying to do this, and it's chugging, and I'm like, come on, like, please don't disqualify me, uh, because I had a one-off moment of frustration. But certainly, <laughs> if you live in my neighborhood, and, you, and some in here do, and you, send me, you see me backing out of the driveway, and I'm just freaking out all the time, every single day, I'm probably having a behavior that would disqualify me from eldership. Um, definitely a wife or an adult child could attest to uh, the validity of that. Next, he's respectable. His conduct, his character in life is one of honor. Um, they ought to be, by the way. I hope you know that. Uh, the role of an elder in the church is to literally oversee the souls of the congregation. Or literally to wield the doctrine of the church. To present to you what the Lord says about your life and what's going on in your life. You're going to have to obey and submit, not to him necessarily, but to the word that's being given to you that he's delivering. If he's not a man that's honorable, if he's not a man that's respectful, it's going to be really hard for you to be like, okay, pastor, yep, you got it. I probably shouldn't be doing that anymore. Thanks for bringing the word to me. I'm going to go, uh, go cry and then I'll, um, yep, got it. He needs to be respectable. Next is he needs to be hospitable. Literally, a sense of homeliness. He's at ease. You, he makes you feel at ease, and he's always offering you comforts so that you feel at home. Whether in the church, congregationally, or when you see him, there's, there's a sense of, I'm at home with him. Uh, where I come from, uh, where I came from, excuse me, before here, a value of the organization I worked for was literally hospitality. And I'm telling you right now, that they did that perfectly. I mean, you could be the visiting, you could be a vis, like you could be the president, and we had him. Uh, you could be a preacher, and we had plenty. You could be a book writer, we had those. A senator, we had them. 
And every single one of them, when they got on the stage where I came from, would always, always, always say how at home they felt in that place. Which, by the way, started from a value that was permeating throughout the whole entire organization of hospitality. Giving a cup of cold water on steroids is what that should mean. And the next is that he's apt to teach. Titus, Paul wrote to him this almost the same identical list in chapter 1. In verse 9, Titus, to type Paul writing to Titus, ends in verse 9, that list of qualifier. Paul says this in verse 9. He must hold firm to the trust, speaking of the elder, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. So that, here we go, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. This is not psychotherapeutic theistic deism here. This is a man literally handling the word of God spoken to the people of God. So what he's going to say say to you is not necessarily coming from him as it is coming from the inerrant, infallible, inspired word of God. That's important that he knows how to handle that. Turn with me to the book of 2 Timothy. So it's like one book over to chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul says this, verse 16, you all, I'm sure, know this verse. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable. What's it profitable for, Paul? For teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. Who is Paul writing to in 2 Timothy? Timothy. Who was Timothy in the church? An elder. So Timothy, remind yourself, this is the authority of the Word of God. The theopneustos, literally the breath of God. And then he says in chapter 4, verse 1 of that same book, this is where it gets kind of spicy. Paul, all of a sudden, almost like barrel chests up to Timothy and says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by the appearing in his kingdom. Verse 2, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. How are you going to do that, Timothy? You're going to reprove. You're going to rebuke. You're going to exhort with complete patience and teaching. The elder needs to understand when he's wielding the word of God, he's literally doing it to that resolve. He's encouraging, he's admonishing, he's rebuking, he's correcting. He's literally like the physician, the spiritual physician of the church. Because the word of God, no doubt, and most importantly, is the health of the church. In one section of scripture, 2 Timothy 3 and 4, Paul values the word of God, its function in the life and health of the church, in the role in which a pastor, Timothy, and others should wield it. Verse, verse 3, back in 1 Timothy chapter 3. He's not to be a drunkard. <laughs> He's not to be a drunkard. What that does not say is that he is forbidden to drink. It does not say, nor does it say in Titus, nor does it say in 1 Peter 5, nor does it say in Proverbs, that the overseer is to have a complete prohibition against alcohol. However, a prohibition against alcohol for the elder would take away the possibility of becoming a drunk. So goes the argument for those who say a pastor should never drink wine, should never have an alcoholic beverage. This is my argument. The Bible never says that, though. The Bible never says that. In fact, and for some of you this may be like, whoa, it warrants it. 
and, and, and furthermore, it warrants it, but it urges caution. It warrants alcoholic consumption, but it urges caution if the pastor is going to be drinking alcohol, specifically wine. In fact, this verse here again does not say not to be drunk. So don't think that you can't drink. Timothy is going to be admonished by Paul to drink wine for his stomach. This qualification here literally says don't be a drunkard. Um, I know a brother up north who's a Calvary Chapel pastor way up north who literally has a pattern of prohibition in his church. So boldly he believes that, that he will literally fire any staff member or elder in his church who ever used one single dollar of the church's or Lord's money to buy a bottle of wine. Fire. Well, if you know anything about that man, before he was saved, he was a brawler, to use Bible terms, he was a drunkard, and he was a strung out drug addict. So I would hope that brother would say, I don't drink anymore. In fact, because I'm a, the, 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 the shepherd of this church, I'm going to hold the standard that nobody will. But wait a minute. I also know a brother way out west who literally would have beer and Bible study. <laughs> yep, there it is. And he had masses of mass of people coming out to this beer and Bible study. Furthermore, he had an itinerant ministry. Um, many books he wrote. It was almost like a trend to, to know this guy. However, his pattern of liberty ended his ministry. He was removed from his church, um, not because of beer and Bible study, by the way, but because of some other character faults. Uh, but he has since started another church now in Arizona, which is all the more, you know, it's growing and the Lord's doing some great things there. This is my view, particularly for the man who is called to eldership with alcohol. My view is that that elder needs to have a public prohibition of alcohol consumption. Meaning that the elder should not be seen publicly drinking. Why? Because the scripture teaches that how do you know if in your drinking you are not going to cause a brother to stumble? If I have a liberty, and I do, all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. If I have that liberty, I want to enjoy that liberty. But far be it from me that that liberty causes another brother or sister to stumble. And so I personally have just the conviction um, that the elder should not be drinking publicly lest he causes somebody to stumble that he doesn't know simply by them viewing him drinking at a bar or, or something like this. Um, the idea of beer and Bible study does not concern me. Uh, and I think, unfortunately, in our, uh, our temperate age that we went through in America, there's a massive stigma on drinking. Uh, but by the way, if you go to Germany, I know some of you have. If you go to England, some of you have. Uh, other places in Europe, it's almost offensive not to accept the ale that they give you. Um, so don't be like, ooh, beer, oh, I don't know. You don't have to be that way. Um, but know what you believe in your heart. Specifically for eldership, we absolutely need to know what we believe in our heart. Next, he says that he's not to be violent but gentle. Clearly, if a drunkard was existing, he's going to be a very violent man. And I say that with sensitivity because I'm sure maybe some of you know that maybe in your own life. Somebody would come home from the bar completely strung out on alcohol and then would seek to do things violently. Um, that's unfortunate. But no doubt that exists. The pastor most certainly then should not be violent, but he should be gentle. Let's just understand something really, really quick. Gentleness does not mean weakness. Gentleness means Christ-likeness. Let me just say this. If you are a Christian, by the way, this is, we're about to look at This is not just for the elder. If you are a Christian and pride yourself in not being gentle, if you're like the tough dude, and there's a lot of tough dudes in this church, there's a lot of tough dudes in this city, I'm grateful for what you've done in toughness, that's awesome. Do a tough mutter, do a Spartan race, shoot your guns, jump out of planes, praise God for jumping you know, soldiers out of planes. But if you pride yourself in that, and you're a Christian, not on gentleness, 
you are very far from the heart of Jesus. Jesus was literally God incarnate who could assemble angels in the thousands, who could have literally put himself off of the cross if he wanted to. Yet he chose not to because his character was completely governed by his gentleness to all enemies and those who would follow him. Here's a question I have for you. How do you remember Jesus coming to you? So many uh, pastor and preacher come across as very black and white, and unfortunately I'm a black and white. Unfortunately, I'm thankful I'm black and white. That's the Lord, maybe whatever. But you get my point. Sometimes we have an idea of, of this, this, this preacher screaming at us and fire and brimstone. and Whoa! But Jesus was found to be very gentle. And I hope if you're a Christian here this morning, you found a Jesus who is gentle to you. Furthermore, I hope you are constantly and consistently humbled that Jesus was so gentle to come to you because your sin was so dank. Jesus in Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says, by the way, the only place ever that Jesus refers to himself in an autobiographical context, meaning this is not the seven I am statements of John. This is literally Jesus saying, if you want to know who I am, man, Christ, this is who I am. Matthew eleven twenty nine. He says, I am gentle and I am lowly. That's it. I am gentle and I am lowly. If you had a snapshot of who Jesus was in his public earthly ministry, it was his gentleness and lowliness. Homework for you, church. If you need something for your devotions, if you need something to dig deeper in the Word, I would just I would I would recommend to you a word study on gentleness in the New Testament, and find out how many times gentleness literally hits home for you as Christian. How can you be gentle? How can you be meek and lowly? Next, he says not to quarrel. He's not to be quarrelsome. Somebody who's always arguing. Somebody who's failing, falling literally into baited questions. Like, you should probably have this sermon if that guy's trying. Like, here we go again. Calvinism and Arminianism debate. All right, man. Like, I don't have really time right now. Like, I don't want to get all heated up about John Calvin. Like, leave me alone. You should know, like, you should have this sermon about that stuff. Literally, Paul will say to Timothy, you have to circumnavigate those questions. Because they will breed quarrel. Next, he's not to be a lover of money. Almost done, I promise, church. Let me clarify this. There was one brother pastor who literally had so much money who had to like release this statement. I have gold, but I have learned to live with bronze. If you get to a point in your own personal wealth and you have to think to myself, man, I have a lot of money that I could have a lot of gold, but I'm going to choose to live with bronze. You got a lot of money. Praise God for that. That's important because what this verse is not saying is that a pastor should be some poor begging guy. It's okay for eldership to have money so long as it doesn't rule that man in ministry. By the way, the person who said that, you probably would be blown away with who that is. Um, but the Lord has so blessed his ministry and has given him so much resource, he literally says, I just give it away because I, I don't want to stumble anybody. I just want to live with bronze. And by the way, this verse doesn't mean materialism either. Materialism, of course, is a bad thing. It can, can stump somebody in the gospel. This is not talking about being materialistic. Actually, what this means is that a man is stingy. In that he loves his money so much, he's going to keep it from other people. This is the guy who literally prides himself as being a money pincher, but not a generous giver. You don't want an elder who says, this is all mine, back the heck up. Even if they're running around in cars that don't have some sort of luxurious symbol on them or something like this. Not a lover of money is a man who's actually contrary, generous. And we all know the Lord loves a cheerful giver. I want to close with these last 
two verses, and if you could read them again with me in 1 Timothy 3, we'll end here. <clears throat> Verse 4 and 5, and we'll close. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how then will he care for God's church. How then will he care for God's church? For the longest time, I read that verse and I thought, wow, the pastor really, really, like he needs to know how to love his wife and he really needs to know how to keep his children in check. If he loves his wife and his children are cool, Man, qualified. What's so crazy about this is that actually has almost nothing to do with what Paul's expressing here in this, these two verses. Let me show you why. There is an idea out there, and I disagree with a Calvary Chapel pastor uh, who's a phenomenal teacher. He's a fellow Spurgeon lover. Um, but I disagree. He said this, The elders should be not concerned with organization, with planning, and administering. Furthermore, his task is to teach the word and to pray. He should not be leading. I disagree with him because of these two verses. If these two verses weren't in the qualifications, I would say, okay, yep, apostles, acts, I think it's 15, word and prayer, got it, seven chosen to serve, y'all go serve, I gotta go pray and fast and read the Bible, really know that thing, I'll be back. Here's the problem though. Who was Paul writing to? He was writing to this protege Timothy. In what time in history was Paul writing to Timothy? Well, in a Greco-Roman period in the first century. So historical context is extremely important, right, when we read the Bible. So is application. And I'm about to apply this verse because I've had to apply it to my own office. Let me read you what one authority says. So glaringly is this verse for qualifications uh, of elders. He says this. Although in the phrase to follow, this requirement resolves itself into family leadership. Right. We see that. The stipulation here initially exceeds Issues of parenting and husbanding to, husbanding to include management of workers, of property, of business, of interests, and even maintenance of important relationships with benefactors, patrons, or clients. What is he saying? For a man to have managed his house in that century means that he had had a leadership mind because of what his house would be offering the community in which this brother, this pastor back then was literally living in. He says this, given the fundamental importance of the household within Greco-Roman culture, which by the way was the microcosm of the Roman Empire, it is not surprising that the householder's reputation would hinge on his success or his failure in this domain. He goes on to say, the Greek word here for management, this is what just blew my mind, is the same one that describes the task of leading in the church. Romans 12, 8, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 Corinthians 12. Therefore, the analogy of the church as a household already is present in the mind of the Apostle Paul. This is where it gets really spicy, okay? Marshall points out, here expanded beyond, this expands the ideas of membership and identity to include a model of leadership. What does that mean? The dominance of the house in shaping patterns of leading, management, authority, and responsibility within the cultural framework made it the natural model for defining an overseer's position. Okay, stop reading that long quote, man. All right, what does that mean? That means in that time, with that house, there was way more to managing that house than simply children, go run and play with Barbie. I'm going to go study my word and pray. That man who was leading in his house had to literally know how to do business with patrons who are coming in to buy from his house. 
which means he had to have a business sense, which means he had to know how to manage people. Quite literally, the leadership quality that hinges this whole entire passage are those two verses right there, that he's a manager of his own house. In our modern context, that is extremely important. Because if you look into a man who's in the eldership and you look at his house and you look at the church, you should probably see some identical things going on. So important that the pastor is both manager and leader and shepherd. What does all this mean for us? And I'll close in prayer. God desires his word the man or man to be leading in a certain way so that his gospel and the message that the gospel brings to to unsaved people or saved people goes completely unadulterated. Unfortunately, there have been vast hurt in the history of the church because of its leaders. We just have to recognize that. We have a lot of stain on the church's history. However, This does not mean we disregard a section of Scripture and qualifying a man based on Scripture because of those hurt. Literally, we don't say, well, there's grace. Who cares? He had an affair a long time ago before he was saved. He's not married to that same woman. Who cares? If you have that mentality, void of the Word of God, you're going to set that church up for failure and unhealth. The gospel matters. Your growth in Jesus matters. And God absolutely cares about who's leading his flock in the church today. Let's pray. I invite Leah to come up to close us in a song. And the elders and their wife, if you could come up. The elders, by the way, are up front if you'd like to pray with them. If you've heard something that maybe you've never heard before and you have a question. Uh, Maybe you're not a Christian here this morning. And at the beginning of this message, you're like, whoa, I didn't know that that's what the gospel is. Uh, I thought I was a good moral Christian. I thought that's all that it was. No, there's way more uh, to the gospel than just doing right and wrong. Praise God for that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We know that it is living and active. Lord, I thank you so much for this passage. It, it's, it's being marginalized to Why should we have qualified leaders in the church? Lord, you know your history of the church. You know the history that has gone on, even in Calvary chapels around the world. Lord, I pray that as we yield ourselves in this local body to your word, Lord, you would permeate health through this church. Lord, you would have an eye on the eldership in this church. You would, Lord, make sure that the men in this church are qualified. Lord, I pray that you would protect this church from threats. Lord, I pray that you'd protect this church from heresy. Lord, I pray you'd protect this church from division. Lord, I pray that you would continue to raise up, not just in the eldership, but but the women and men in this church. You would raise up leaders in this church, Lord, who can do the work of the ministry. Lord, thank you for the people here. Lord, I pray, Lord, if there's anybody that doesn't know you here this morning, Lord, I pray that they would not leave this church body. They wouldn't leave this congregation without asking a little bit more on what it means to be a Christian. Jesus, thank you for...